Welcome everybody. Thanks for coming to our Open Science Seminar. Today we are very happy to welcome Amy Orban to give a lecture on errors in science, how to avoid them, how to detect them, maybe how to hide them, I don't know. <laughs> so Amy studied at the universities of Cambridge and Oxford and uh, she got her PhD in experimental psychology. Her main research interest is how digital technologies and social media affect uh, adolescence. And currently, she's a research fellow at the University of Cambridge, and she's very active in promoting open science principles. She's one of the co-founders of the Reproducibility Shauna Club and Post podcast, and uh, this um, Sean Club initiative started already when she was still a PhD student and meanwhile it spread out over 25 countries. So it's a big success and we are very happy to have you here, Amy. Thank you. Yeah, it's, um, I'm actually announcing tomorrow that I'll be stepping down as chair of reproducibility of the Journal Club um, because it's for early career researchers and I worry that if I stay too much longer it'll be a bit weird. <laughs> um, but yes, yeah, thank you for having me. I'm just going to go share my slides. That should work. So, and I'm going to hide myself so I don't look at myself the whole entire time. There we go. <laughs> um, so yes, I'm broadcasting from my home office um, and it must be dark where you are, but it's going to turn darker. So I'm going to try to put on some lighting if necessary um, after the, the we finish the talk, if, if it gets too dark. Um, but yeah, so I, one of the things I do at the University of Cambridge, um, in addition to being kind of, I'm like a, P, a PI, a, a lab leader, but my lab is just me. Um, that's kind of the position that I have is I teach an open science course for graduates um, over two terms. Um, and this is one of my favorite lectures from there, um, kind of changed a bit um, to fit this format, but it's about approaching scientific error. And I think it's something that I've only really learned a lot about over, over time. So some of you might have seen this figure before. Um, it's from The Economist and this is where they try to um, show how easily scientific findings can be false. So these are a thousand hypothetical studies. Um, and we actually, at the moment, we don't know anything about this yet, but maybe you're a PhD student. And probably in my time over four years, I probably surveyed a thousand papers. Um, I probably didn't read all of them, but I, at least I read the abstract. Um, so, so you, these might be the thousand papers that you look at to build your PhD work. Um, and naturally, oh no, this is, this is different. <laughs> these are the thousand scientific hypotheses, um, not the thousand scientific papers. So I've, I started my talk on the wrong foot. Um, but because naturally, if, if any field, we can have a different proportion of true or false ideas. Um, so these are a thousand different hypotheses and maybe 10 of them are naturally true. And I'm, I, I probably not had a thousand ideas in my PhD. I might have a hundred. Um, and the different proportions of the things that might be true, the, the ideas that we have that might be true versus not true are different. But let's assume that 10% of all scientific hypotheses in, in our field is true while the others are false. If it would be, you know, 100% of our ideas are true, then we would be fortune tellers. So um, I think 10% is a good number. So now um, what you have is um, you run your studies um, and you, what we normally do is we have a p-value of 0 0.05. Um, so we were testing these 1,000 ideas and by taking a p-value of 0 0.05, we say that actually it's okay if 5% of um, all of our hypotheses that, that are actually wrong come up as true. It's the 5% false positive rate that actually something that doesn't exist comes out as showing that it does exist. So I've now grouped all of these um, false positives in, in that kind of corner. So if we do have a thousand ideas and we run a thousand studies, we would expect 
if we use a p-value of 0 0.05, that 45%, 45 of those that aren't um, actually true show up true in our data. So they, they actually, we actually think they are correct while they're actually false. Um, but also, it, it, we don't just have false positives, we have um, false negatives as well. And false negatives are a bit harder to understand. It's not just like a p-value of 0 0.05 because it's to do with power. It's kind of how many participants we recruit or how many measurements we take. It's kind of like how powerful our microscope is to see the effects that we're trying to find in our data. And, you know, maybe we say that we're going to have 80% power. That's a pretty good power study. And by 80% power, we mean that um, if the effect is true, so if our idea is true, um, then we will find that is true 80% of the time. But that means that in 20% of the time, even though it's true, we will think that actually it's false. And those are the red dots. So naturally that only happens in the kind of ideas that are actually true. <laughs> um, and now I'm gonna scrunch them up as well, up at the top. So with 80% power, you know, actually we have a lot of the research literature where the ideas were wrong and we find that they're wrong. We have a small proportion of the literature where we find that where the ideas are true and we find that they're true, but we have this proportion where the ideas are wrong, but we find that they're true or the idea is true and we find that they're wrong. If we assume that 10% of our, of our ideas are right and that we have 80% power and we use a p-value of 0 0.05, these are all assumptions, um, we find that 65% of all positive findings in our literature, only 65% of them are true positives. So if all of these thousand scientific ideas go through the scientific study process and are published, and, and maybe only the positives are published, for example, um, then 65% of those are actually true, um, while 35% are false. And actually, we might have way worse power. So I sit in a neuroimaging institute, um, and maybe neuroimaging studies only have 20% power. That makes it a lot worse than the graph looks like this. <laughs> and that means that actually only 30% of the true findings are actually true positives. So the vast majority of scientific findings might be false. And this is the thinking that actually brought John Ioannidis to his, his paper, which a lot of people cite as one of those first kind of hallmarks of of the repl replicability crisis, um, which started these conversations. And he noted why most public research, published research findings are false. And that's because if we take the power of the field at the moment and we need to make all of these assumptions, it could very well be that most of the positive findings that we read in the literature, maybe to build our research area and to build our, our graduate study, that actually most of them are false. So, Long story short, um, and I've, I've done this description a lot better in the past, um, but what, these, what this paper shows and, and the, the visualization show is that there will be errors in our literature and there will be everywhere. Kind of how bad it is, is a question of our assumptions. But um, we as scientists have to deal with errors. And a lot of, a lot of time when we talk about errors, we talk about self-correction. You know, that naturally there will be errors, but slowly science will self-correct. You know, th published findings that are false won't kind of, somebody will retest them and then we find that actually it doesn't work or people just don't build on things that stop working. And so that all of a sudden we do self-correct as a science. Errors are everywhere, but it's actually okay for us because um, we can weed them out over time. However, I, th I think probably in your course, you've already covered a lot of things that might be really challenging our ability to self-correct. And we shouldn't just assume that self-correction is just a thing that happens. For example, you have publication bias, people fabricate results. Um, we have underpowered studies making maybe the amount of errors huge. So if only 30% of our positive findings are actually true, is science actually good enough to self-correct, you know, if we have such power problems. 
is science, can science self-corrective data is inadequate if we cannot check results, if there is biases in the publication process. And so a lot of people have been talking about, you know, should we actually assume that self-correction is, is happening? Should we assume that the errors that we do or that other people um, do in their work will actually become weeded out over time? And this is a really nice tweet that, that captures this. Um, I screenshot this in 2017, um, but that science is self-correcting. Uh, sure, when we correct it, not because of a magical process. So what James Heathers is saying here is that because we all naturally have errors in the literature and because we because there are all these challenges to self-correcting, to finding errors, to locating them and to rectifying them, we need to make a conscious effort to correct our literature, our work and others' work. And we shouldn't just assume it's going to happen because of some magical process. So in this lecture, I hope to cover how to respond to errors in your own work and how to respond to errors in other people's work. So hopefully in this first part, I've convinced you that errors are probably everywhere and we shouldn't just assume that they will be found and they'll be rectified. So we need to have an active role. And in, a, in this part of the lecture, I'll go through what you can do for your own work and for other people's work. So firstly, in your own work, um, in your own work, there's a lot of things that, that can go wrong. Um, my PhD supervisor, Dorothy Bishop, has talked a lot about how difficult it is to correct errors, especially if you're a young researcher. You know, what if you've done three years of work into something, you found the result, you've written up your paper, you know, you've submitted it to reviewers and all of a sudden you kind of check your code and you find that you've, um, you forgot to swap a questionnaire around. You know, I, I do this a lot, forgetting to um, recode it. And, and all of a sudden you, you built all this work on nothing. So naturally, if that happens to you, you could keep quiet. Maybe you don't publish your code um, and just go on and publish it. Or you need to actually stand up and, and man up, in how she always says, to that error and try to rectify it yourself. But that's really hard. Um, but there is, you know, even if it's in the published literature, it's a lot harder. Um, there is some really nice evidence, though, that if you stand up to your error, that is actually really good. It's, and I'll have some personal experiences um, later, but that retraction, for example, of a paper, if you find an error. So for example, if, if you found the coding error only after publication, um, that retractions due to an honest error actually do not result in reputational damage for junior researchers. So people have studied this. It doesn't look like people trust them less. Um, further, Another study found that reputation seems to be based on knowledge um, and how you respond to, for example, if something fails to replicate, if there seems to be an error, not whether an error is there. And I think that open science will make the spotting of errors increasingly likely. If we share our data and our code. If you're, if you're writing 800 lines of code, there will be an error in somewhere. Um, and open science is making these errors increasingly spotted. So I say example ABCD, um, ABCD is a big neuroimaging study in, in teens and they're, they're studying I think 10,000 teenagers over 10 years in the US and they're making all of their scripts open and all of their data open. And they've, I think they found two massive coding errors in that and they're probably the best neuroimaging analyzers I know. Um, and, and they published the data and two people found quite massive errors like that some participants had their brain imaging flipped. And I think if it happens to them, it probably happens to all of us. And, you know, it, it does. I've corrected my own work. <laughs> Here's my first corrigendum for, for one of my studies. Um, finding an error in your own work is really hard. Um, and as a PhD student, I found this really challenging. But actually, by correcting it, you take a weight off your, off your shoulders. Um, and I found that it hasn't impacted in my reputation. Um, for example, what I now do is I, on my Open Science Framework page where I upload all my data and all my analyses, I have a frozen version of the analyses that these, this was how the analyses were at publication. 
but I also have one that I update over time if people find a small error, if people feel like they can do things better. And so, for example, here um, in January this year, I have noted that people should please use the live version of the code because there was a small coding mistake found on line 84. It doesn't change any of the results. It changed some of the decimal points. I discussed with my editor, we decided not to correct the paper, but there will be, you know, and this will probably be supplemented um, as many people have used this code that people do still find things that can be improved. And I'm not alone. Um, Francis Arnold won the Nobel Prize. Um, and this was a really high um, kind of visible tweet where she said that her first tweet in 2020 is that she's totally bummed to announce that they have retracted last year's work on enzymatic synthesis in bactylactamins. The work has not been reproducible. And she wrote that it is painful to admit, but important to do so. I apologize to all. I was a bit busy when this was submitted and did not do my job well. And people actually really positively responded to her retracting her work, saying that there was something about the data that they couldn't tra trace back <laughs> to how they had come to a specific conclusion. Um, and for somebody, you know, with a Nobel Prize to own up that we all do make mistakes. So this section is mainly there to that errors do happen in our own work. And even though it's really, you know, there's a tension between just keeping quiet um, and hoping nobody spots it and coming clean. Um, there is really um, something long-term worthwhile uh, coming clean about errors. I'm happy to talk more about my personal experience in that in the question and answer session, because I know it can be extremely difficult, but we are, we are just doing our work and, and doing our work best often means owning up to when there has been a small error. But, you know, let's talk about errors in others' work. That's probably more fun <laughs> um, because I think errors in your own work always makes you a bit nervous. Um, and errors in others' work has been also more, a lot more controversial. You know, how should we call out other errors in work that's not ourselves, or that we haven't done ourselves. Um, here's a, a sketch of James Heathers, um, whose tweet we saw earlier, and Nick Brown, who have done a lot of work um, calling out you know, problems in other people's work. Uh, Nick Brown just finished his PhD. He started his PhD after kind of retiring from his normal job um, that he had for many, many years. James Heathers was an early career researcher that actually this year moved out of academia. Um, which shows you maybe how uh, difficult this process actually is in calling out other people's errors because it, often people respond very negatively to it. So Susan Fisk is a really high level psychologist and, and James Heathers and, and Nick Brown work mainly in psychology. And she you know, said that the field of psychology is always encouraged, required really peer critiques, but the self-appointed data police are volunteering critiques of such personal veracity and relentless frequency that they resemble a denial of service attack that crashes a website by sheer volume of traffic. Unmoderated attacks create collateral damage and that they're more like, they, she called them methodological terrorists, which, which was kind of a term that stayed for many years. So these uh, people who go through other people's papers trying to spot these errors to correct the literature are being called methodological terrorists by some of the kind of big people, at least in the psychological field. This was, I think, about 10 years ago, but it even is happening now. Um, in Slate magazine, Samin Vizier wrote in 2020 that scientists are very quick to say that science is self-correcting, but those who do the work behind this correction often get accused of damaging their field or worse. We are often told, if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all. So again, we have this tension. It's a different tension than in errors in your own work, but there is a tension there. Do we call out if we don't believe something is right and we go into something that seems like a conflict that goes against kind of maybe how we normally are told to act? Or do we call something out because that's what needs to be done to actually self-correct our science? Indeed, you know, criticism is really the bedrock, the basis of the scientific method. Um, and Dorothy Bishop, in, in, this is a great piece of work, actually, this citation, and you'll be shared the slides. So if you read one thing, read this. <laughs> it's about responding errors in your own and others' work. Um, what she says is that naturally criticism is really important, but we should try to not make it personal. And I think that might be that solution 
if we shouldn't, by pointing out errors, we shouldn't apply that the person is stupid or dishonest. Um, and we need to ensure we can kind of have a conversation about errors or problems in work without getting on that personal level. And I think that's really hard. It's really hard to associate or to dissociate the science from the scientist. So if I, if I criticize a paper, it often seems as if I'm inevitably criticizing the author, but maybe we need to get somewhere. And I put, you know, the German word Fila Kultur there, you know, get somewhere where we have a better culture around pointing out errors without going into that interpersonal conflict. Because we really need error detectors. You know, we need to find these errors and we need to rectify them. Um, but error detection takes time. Um, and you know, we so there's a lot of things that we need to change to enable it. We need to one, make it more worthwhile that people don't think you're criticizing them, they don't call you a methodological terrorist. But there should probably be more training, funder recognition, or departmental policies on really supporting constructive criticism um, and making it more of an established training in science as well. And again, this might be something nice to discuss. Um, do we get trained enough to, to spot errors and discuss them well? I discuss a lot with my undergrads around, you know, how a study could be made better, but we don't normally talk about, you know, what if there could have been an error in this study? <laughs> so I think there, there is a long way to go to, to really improving how we talk about errors. Naturally, there is a real difference between scientific error and fraud. You know, scientific error doesn't mean that somebody falsified their data, it means that they made a mistake. So by pointing out an error, you shouldn't, you know, it's probably not that you think that person's being fraudulent, that they're cheating or making up data. However, there has been a lot of work in that as well. And, and data falsification is a problem. I don't think it's as you know, there has been work saying that about 1% of scientists say that they've falsified data at some point in their life, which is actually one in 100, it's very high. <laughs> um, I think it, so, so it's a different type of problem, but there's some really nice examples of error detectors that have detected fraud. So that's a different kind of finding of errors. For example, Elizabeth Bisbeck um, has a real talent in spotting um, duplications in Western blots. So if you, in the biological sciences, Western blots are a real kind of key of your scientific method um, for many researchers. And she screened up to, I think over 20,000 papers from 40 different journals between, published between 1995 and 2014 for duplications. And she has this like innate ability to spot them. Um, she's a great person to follow on Twitter <laughs> um, because she posts these things um, where I, I never find the duplication. But for example, this is a paper she screened um, and I wouldn't have seen it, <laughs> but she found this duplication that somebody had just copy pasted. Um, these images are exactly the same, even though they're from a different measurement. And the same, these two images are exactly the same and these two. So this is a blatant kind of, well, it could be an error. It's probably fraud if you copy pasted three different images uh, into the same. So this is where, you know, there's a kind of copy paste uh, change in the image. What she also spots is where only parts of the image are duplicated. So again, if you look at the green square, you see that actually this is the same picture, <laughs> just smaller. Um, and this is again in a published paper. Um, and this one is just smaller and, and here you have the, the same as well. So somebody has taken subsections of images and put them back together. Or you have kind of way more complicated duplication designs. Here, for example, um, she spotted that these two were actually kind of duplicated on these two lines. So she screened these 20,000 papers for image duplications. And she found that actually one out of every 25 papers had some sort of problematic images. Um, and that the pro prevalence of problematic images are on the rise. So I put, a, a, this is a really great podcast episode with her. Um, again, you'll have access to the slides um, and you'll hopefully click on it. <laughs> Another 
error detection, um, people who have spotted errors are Keith Bagley and Kevin Coombs. These are biostatisticians, and they spend over 1,500 hours checking the work of Anil Potti, who was a cancer researcher. And this is a really long story. Again, I'll have some links if you want to follow up their whole story. Um, but what they more or less found is that um, he had a paper about genomic tests for cancer, which loads of people were using, and they, they felt like the results were kind of too good to be true. Um, and what they, what they did is they actually looked at the data and they tried to replicate the data and they just couldn't get it to replicate, uh, even though it was in an open database. <laughs> so this was the results that the kind of gene results that the paper had. This is the one that they found. And you can see that the only difference is actually the numbers. They're all, always up by one. And what they actually found that it was a off by one error um, where the research team had forgotten to delete a header in an Excel spreadsheet <laughs> before kind of copy pasting things in. Um, they also found kind of true errors of and found fraud in the rest of the papers that I don't have time to talk about. Um, so for example, these are big correlation matrices and, and here you see that there must be some sort of duplication in these rows there. And so they did these 1,500 hours of work, finding that this work was actually really problematic. Um, they talked about it. Nobody really wanted to know. <laughs> Four clinical trials were, were starting to use the approach. And actually, Potti was only found out because somebody else found that he'd falsified his CV. And then people started getting interested in, in the claims that Keith and, and Kevin had made. And again, there's a really great video lecture of them there. Um, the last kind of error checking example is about general sloppiness. So this was um, from my own field again. So this is about Brian Wanzik, who was an eminent marketing professor in food psychology, who was, you know, he was headed up the White House, uh, appointed lead for a diet. Um, he had a huge amount of citations, um, but he made one mistake in writing a blog post where he talked about that he had a visiting PhD student. He never named her. He named her the woman from Turkey. Um, and she, he said that he gave her data, a data set of a self-funded failed study, which had null results. I had three ideas for a potential plan B, C, D um, as plan A had failed. I told her what the analysis should be and what the table should look like. Um, a postdoc had previously said no to, you know, trying these new analyses. Um, and he said that this postdoc from the visiting PhD student from Turkey actually um, was, you know, really got into the project. Every day she came back with puzzling new results. And every day we would scratch our heads, ask why, and come up with another way to reanalyze the data with yet another set of plausible hypotheses. And these resulted in four articles based on one single study. Naturally, this sounds a lot like p hacking. And so people started actually going through these studies. Um, they started with these papers he wrote his blog post about um, and more or less found a huge amount of inconsistencies, which le led to the retraction of, of four papers. Um, and this was all done by a group of PhD students. And then they found another email thread um, where he was writing to another PhD student saying, you know, they've done a study and I would really like you to dig into this to find a number of situations or people for which the relationship does hold. They found that the relationship wasn't significant and he asked them to kind of dig into this study more. Um, and he gave them all these different things to split the data with. So he said, um, think of different ways you can cut the data and analyze subsets of it to see when the relationship holds. Here are some groups you would want to analyze separately, males, females, lunch goers, dinner goers, people sitting alone, et cetera, et cetera. Even more, <laughs> look at different result variables. Um, and at the very bottom, it says, work hard, squeeze some blood out of this rock. So out of this study that doesn't have a significant result and we'll see you soon. So again, really motivating people to p-hack, um, which a lot of people found very problematic. And so there was Tim Van Drusie and his colleagues went through all the papers. 
and more or less they found a huge amount of inconsistencies. So um, this is just a, a list of all the inconsistencies they found and they've more or less, this is all the inconsistencies. Um, there's a, a lot, they found duplication um, in writing. So they checked if there was self plagiarism. Um, and so what happened there is that actually that led to multiple retractions and corrections and ones that left ended up leaving Cornell. So there, this is a bit different because he wasn't actually being fraudulent. He was just being sloppy and encouraging bad research practices. So I think this is an example that shows that it's actually sometimes hard to differentiate fraud from just error. And again, this might be something really nice to, to talk about. So I know that I'm already at three minutes past, but I'll just quickly go through some tools you can use to find errors in your work or other people's work. And again, the slides are available. There are links on these, so you can kind of do have a look as well. So the first is StatCheck. So StatCheck um, is a software which checks if p-values are consistent with the degrees of freedom and test statistics. So if you do a t-test, um, you, you show the kind of test statistic, the t-value, um, and you show the degrees of freedom. And actually, from all that information, you can just calculate what the p-value should be. So what Michelle Norton and her team did was actually create um, a program that reads all of these different test statistics and checks whether the p-values are consistent with them. So it's kind of like spell check for statistics. <laughs> so here we have our t-test. It has 48 degrees of freedom. The t-value was 0 0.28, and it was reported as being under 0 0.05, but actually we can calculate it and the p-value is actually 0 0.78. And her team, ran this program on 250,000 p-values in major psychology journals and actually found that one in eight papers contained a really inconsistent p-value. You can do, you can use this tool online. So you could upload your own paper to it <laughs> and check. And there's now um, a lot of journals, well, not a lot, some journals that use this tool. So they ask you to just double check whether your p-values make sense. So this is one way to look for errors. Another way, um, which I won't be able to go into in detail, but there's a link there, is looking is doing Grim. So Grim is looking at means. So for example, if I had a sample size of three, um, and it was kind of how many cats do you have, um, and the mean was reported to be zero point two. It's kind of not possible <laughs> because um, if you divide something by three, it can only be kind of 0 0.3 recurring, 0 0.6 recurring, or 0 0.9 recurring, if, I, if I'm right. No, 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 0 0.3 recurring or 0 0.6 recurring. <laughs> That's the only kind of decimal places that are, are kind of probable, well, that are mathematically possible if you divide a whole number by three. So there is a way to kind of check tables if you know the number of participants to actually figure out, is there, is, are these decimal points actually possible with the amount of participants that we have? And the same team has done something different with kind of iteration techniques. So that's Sprite. Again, there are links for you to look at in your own time. So this was really a kind of whistle-stop tour introduction into error and fraud. So we know that science is riddled with both correct and incorrect scientific results. That's not because, you know, this is, it's amplified, the, the problem is amplified by kind of problematic practices and maybe things we can do better. But even in a perfect world, we would probably expect there to be quite a, you know, few, quite a good percentage amount of errors in our literature. So we need to make sure that science can self-correct. Self-correction is really crucial. Um, and we need, so we need to encourage an environment where we can own up to our own errors and we can find other people's errors and we can, we can call them out and correct the literature. But all too often, error detection is seen as personal criticism if you're doing it to somebody else, or it's seen as kind of a big problem if you're doing it to your own work. Even though we, we should probably assume that there are errors in a lot of different pieces of work. But there's a rising number of tools that can be used for error detection. So things like StatCheck um, 
or grim are, are methods that can start getting us somewhere where it's a bit easier to look for errors. But I think my reflection is that we do need a better culture about talking about errors because um, it is such a crucial part of science, but we often are made to feel like we need to be infallible. We, we're not allowed to make errors and other people are not allowed to make errors. Um, and I don't think, I think that's just very far away from the truth. So thank you for listening. Um, I'm really looking forward to your questions um, and sorry for overrunning <laughs> a tiny bit.